Coach Brad here. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about the Chasing Poker Greatness VIP newsletter. Hopping onto the VIP newsletter is the absolute best thing you can do to ensure this plucky little podcast keeps going indefinitely into the future. When you sign up, you'll get exclusive behind the scenes Chasing Poker Greatness content, access to the private Chasing Poker Greatness Slack community, notifications for product launches, entries into monthly free coaching giveaways, and much, much more. So if you're wondering what the absolute best thing you can do to support your favorite poker podcast, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP and access the newsletter today. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP. And now, back to the show. legendary champions next generation stars and tireless ambassadors of the game sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt this is chasing poker greatness with your host brad wilson This is your host, Brad Wilson, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, and today my guest is former Thirst Lounge host, Twitch partner, and professional poker player, Bet on Drew, Drew Gonzalez. I think you're really going to love how open and self-reflective Drew is about his more than decade-long poker journey. He had absolutely no problem opening up about struggles that many of us in the poker world have probably faced at some point or another, from relationship issues to unhealthy lifestyle choices and the extremely common curse of the young, believing you are way better at playing cards than you actually are. In today's episode, you're going to learn a small change in Drew's mindset that allowed him to thrive when he had previously been struggling how an unhealthy lifestyle threatened Drew's online poker career, why his move to the West Coast was the reset he needed at the right time, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you Twitch partner and professional poker player, Drew Gonzalez. Drew, welcome to the show. How are you doing, sir? Good, Brad. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Starting out this show, I'd like to know about your story. What's your story as far as playing cards? So my story playing cards started uh, back in my early college days. I remember the first time I got exposed to it. I was living with three other guys. It was like my sophomore year or something. And the moneymaker boom happened, right? And they started getting into it. It was on TV. And uh, when I first found out about it, I kind of just came out of my room and they had a bunch of bottle caps on the table and they were playing. And I actually like made fun of them at first. I was like, what is this stupid game you guys are doing now? Right. Because they were just like funny type of guys like that. And for, you know, a couple of times I saw them play it. I didn't think anything of it. Eventually I sat down and played it. And that was kind of like the first first time I got into it, even though we didn't even know the rules, then it was, it was really, really bad. Sure. I mean, that's how it was for most people is when they were starting out, they want to participate. So what year is this? How old were you? I was probably 20, let's see, sophomore year. I don't think I was, was I old enough to drink then yet? I was really young when I graduated. Actually, I don't even know if I was technically old enough. No, I wasn't. I wasn't 21 yet. Uh, so I was like maybe 20, 19, something like that. And this game, so young young man who falls in love with the allure of poker, it's a tale as old as time. How, like, tell me what you thought and what you were thinking after you played cards. Like, what was the draw for you? The draw for me when, it, for a while, it was like nothing. I didn't care, really. But then one of my uh, basketball buddies introduced me to uh, the Super Systems book. And he was super competitive. And this guy, like, on and off the court was just super competitive. And he had one of those 
minds that intrigued me. I was like, oh, okay, this guy doesn't just follow the flow. You know what I mean? Like he figures things out. And so when you say super competitive, what do you mean by that? I mean, like so competitive that when you like get on the court or like you're doing something, he was just super focused on it. Like nothing could deter him. All he cared about was like winning. You get what I mean? He, you wouldn't get like half ass efforts from this guy. Yeah. And every time you could count on him, you know, and that's kind of how I gauge that. Yeah. There's like two ways to look at it. And typically when I hear somebody say that they're ultra competitive, it's code for their horrible losers. Like <laughs> they're just very volatile emotionally and mm-hmm. they're really bad losers. Right. And then the yeah. other, the other side of the coin is just intense focus and willing to put in the work and do what it takes in order to be as good as you can be at whatever endeavor you're trying to make. And I, I assume that it's a second for your friend. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's definitely the second, but uh, it's cool that you say that because there's definitely the other one. I didn't necessarily, you know, categorize them as the two, but that's exactly it. It feels like. Yeah, I mean, like basically, when I hear somebody, they're like, "Oh, I'm just super competitive." That's like their statement, their non-apology apology for acting like a jackass in any game that you're playing. You know? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. But then when I like first kind of came into him, and you know, you have that certain level of respect, then. Uh, he showed me the side of poker. I was like, look, like this is, you can actually like beat people. Like there's a strategy, there's, there's a way to go about things. And I remember that moment he gave me that book. I started reading it. I was like, wow, we've been playing these home games with our buddies, like just like off feel and what we see on TV. I was like, I felt like it was the game. It was a game genie for me. You know what I mean? I thought I'll unlock cheat codes here. And then from that point, I was just like, sucked in to like the fact that you can compete the competitiveness behind the game is what really continues to suck me in is wanting to be better and there's just no better feeling than being the last person in a tournament you know what i mean standing for sure i i actually don't know what you mean i I don't think i've won a tournament in like 15 years so (laughs) (laughs) but yeah like I can imagine that beating a tournament for having a big score is it's obviously why you play tournaments. It's why you endure the pain. That's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Oh, for sure. For sure. So you, you realize that there's strategy and that sort of opens the door to poker. What were your next moves? What'd you do after that? So after that, I started to then take it a bit more serious. And I started to like organize games with my buddies is like, Hey guys, look twice a week, we should all get together. You know what I mean? And play these games. Like I needed to be out there and implementing and just competing against all the guys that played my poker game. We're also on our like basketball team, our intramural basketball team. So we're all really competitive. We're all buddies. We all like drank together and partied. So it was kind of like a, a natural course of things. So I really then just started to have that game that I wanted to always be playing with the guys. And then I started to get online. I remember I found out about poker stars and they were still in the States. It was pre black Friday. So I can remember a bunch of nights just, I wasn't even actually, we were playing tournaments there, but I don't think I played for some reason tournaments online. I wanted to play the cash games and I can remember, Oh man, just a tragic, like deposit 10 deposit 10. It's like, I was so lost. It was funny for a while, but uh, yeah, I just ever since then really like never put it down. Always found time to play like a $20 sit and go. Like I remember I was uh, dating this girl from high school and we were doing this long distance relationship thing. But after I found out in college and I would go home and hang out with her, I was, (laughs) I was kind of like waiting for her to like fall asleep some nights. So I was like, okay, you know, we hung out. I was like, okay are you going to bed now? (laughs) And then I would, (laughs) you know what I mean? Fire up a a $20 sit and go on party poker. I remember like the old school party poker and man, I just the, the the adrenaline or the, you know what I mean? The excitement to like, okay, I got to beat these guys. Let's see what happens. Like, you know, when you still like excited to flop two pairs, like, Oh, this is so exciting. Yeah. I remember those days. I yearn for those days actually, because early on you're just absorbing so much knowledge that you're making gains on a regular basis in your game. It doesn't, you know, once you hit a certain point, it's like you make gains still, but they're much smaller in comparison to when you first start out. For sure, for sure. That's a good point. I don't think about that 
like I remember those moments and kind of what drew us in, but you're right about the noticeable gains. It like really keeps you hungry for a while. And then I think about like later in our career where the gains aren't quite as much, you know, you have to kind of fight to stay hungry. You know what I mean? In in a different way. You need to, that curiosity that kind of guides you is like learning uh, more optimal ways to play deeper in the decision tree, which isn't as sexy because it doesn't come up all the time um, from when you first start. But this is still a part of the draw, at least for me, is staying curious and realizing that like 16 years of doing this, playing millions and millions of hands, making a living from it this whole time, and I still have things to learn. Like that's a a testimony to the complexity of poker. And I just, I love poker because of that. That's what makes the game great in my opinion. So when did it stick? When did you finally make your deposit that allowed you to, you know, make a run? I would say when it finally stuck for me, it was years after that. I, I was, uh, a recreational player. I didn't dig in like after that book, I kind of felt like I had such a big edge over my friends that I I, I didn't stay hungry to keep going. I had other things. I I was, you know, getting my degree and then having to work and then girlfriend and stuff like that. So it faded a little bit, but I would still like play online, like sit and goes here and there for many years or me and my buddies would go to go to Atlantic city I went to college in Pennsylvania, so we would drive over to Atlantic City, you know, all right, we got 500 bucks, let's go guys. And then, man, it never lasted long enough. Uh, But, you know, we would do that. And then for a while, and then I moved to, when it finally stuck for me, I moved to North Carolina at this point with my girlfriend. And I remember I was working and then I would come home and I would play, you know, and do that. And I was making like... No, actually, I, I was like doing the $50 to hide up my deposits from like 10, 20 bucks to 50 bucks at this point. Okay. And I would have to deposit, bust, deposit. And then there was one day where I was just like, I guess I was starting to feel like a, a loser or something. You know what I mean? I just like hated the idea of depositing again. I felt like I was just like wasting money. And I didn't have a lot at the time. So I remember the moment where I was like, okay. I'm going to do bankroll management here. (laughs) I was like, I'm putting $20 on. And if I cannot spin this up, then that's it. That's what I said in my head anyway. You know, I had had made a a commitment. And I started to play these 50 cent six max sit and goes on carbon poker that were like pinned to the top of the lobby. And if I would win one or two, I would take a shot in a dollar MTT. But I was just like, I had to prove something to myself. You know what I mean? That I could do it and that I could actually manage a role, but I had to start low. And that was the turning point for me in poker when I was like, oh, okay, I can actually, I did spin it up. You know what I mean? From that point. And then I built up like a 5k bankroll from there. And And what was it more a discipline issue as far as how things were going previously? Yeah, for sure. I, I would say I didn't take it seriously I, like i didn't have any poker friends outside of my buddies in college but then you know after after that we kind of split up did our own thing so while i was in like the working world i was basically it was me and maybe one other buddy but it wasn't like a big thing but i was still like really passionate about it like i needed to i've always needed to satisfy that competitive urge and and poker did that for me so yeah, once once I did that and realized that I could spin it up, that just changed my mindset on it. I went from just playing it as a game to like managing it like a business. And then what happened? Post, you know, you run it up to 5K, your bankroll, what was the next step? <laughs> the next step for me was, uh, there was one time prior with the one buddy that I was talking about where we like quit our jobs and we like... Uh, stayed home and we were like, all right, we're going to make it. And we were playing on Bodog, was still Bodog then. And we just couldn't break through and we just lost all of our money. But uh, what was the feeling there when you, you gave it a shot and you both went broke? It, it felt like I was hopeful that it could be a thing. But then when 
it didn't turn out to be a thing and I had to get a job again. I was like, oh, wow, this is hard. I felt empty. I felt like, I was like, man, I was like, there's got to be a way or something, you know, but it was for sure just like a straight fail. And then the second time after I did that $20 to 5K, I was still working a job. Uh, My girlfriend at the time was not, but I had hit a ceiling in my job. I was doing home health care, recruiting and management for a a private home health care agency. And it was just kind of hitting a ceiling there. I didn't like the boss and the way things were going. And I had just had a $2,500 score like a week before. And I reached my boiling point with my job. And then I was like, okay, I know I failed before. But if I'm ever going to, but, but it was a half-assed attempt. You know what I mean? So in the back of my head, I always knew that I didn't give it my full effort. So, and this was in 2010 then now, I was like, okay. Uh, my, my girlfriend was actually just training for a job. I remember I quit my job. I was like, okay, I have 2,500 bucks um, that I can cash out. I was like, I still have a role. I was like, this time I'm going, this is going to be my no regrets attempt. Like, this is it. Like, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to focus. I'm going to figure this game out. I was like, I'm not with my buddy. It's just her and I. I don't have many distractions. I was like, I need to know. You know, I was in my, like, mid-20s. Well, what and, was and the, I, the, the difference in mindsets from shot number one to shot number two? The difference in the mindset was that, uh, well, I had a little, I had a little more of a taste this time, you know, cause I had spun up money that I hadn't spun up before. So kind of removing myself from all the distractions of my buddies, cause all my friends and everyone was in Pennsylvania and I moved to North Carolina at this point to kind of get away from the drinking and partying every other day and stuff. It was kind of tough to get away from for me cause you just had so many friends and it's what you did. You worked for the weekends and then you just partied and you know it it was it was kind of a for me it felt like a destructive cycle really I I didn't like it and I had to get away from it so I knew that I didn't have distractions this second time around and I knew that I couldn't fail this time that that was kind of the big things that like motivated me like I just had to figure it out and I knew I had some cushion I knew I could make it I knew I was already winning it was just a matter of me focusing all my energy there instead of having to go to work and then come back. I was like, it just had a different belief system, I guess, maybe kind of going into it. Yeah. The reason that I asked the question is because like self-sabotage is a very real thing. And what folks do a lot of times, instead of just committing to a thing and giving it their all, they'll make some sort of halfway commitment. And basically, they do this halfway commitment to give themselves an excuse if it doesn't work out, right? Because the biggest fear is that they're just not good enough, that they give everything they have and they still fall short. Like th- this is our biggest fear in most endeavors. So when you play under rolled, for instance, really what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I'm playing, but I'm not, you're holding back. Because you can't realize you're not good enough until you fully invest yourself in the process. That's, that's when you gain that realization, whether you're going to be profitable or you're not going to be profitable. And most people, they don't want to admit <laughs> that, that they're not mm-hmm. good enough or that they can't make it. So what happens is they put themselves in spots where they're likely to fail and they still have that excuse in their head that, well, okay, I tried, but you know, I, I could have done things differently, yada, yada, yada. So this time, when you say you can't fail and you're committing yourself fully, this is just a whole different mindset from earlier on. And I think that folks who are listening to this, like if you're listening to this right now and maybe that describes you, think about that, consider that and ask yourself, like, if I want to win at this game, am I doing everything it takes? And am I going to find out whether I can make it or not? And if, if you can't find that out, you're probably not risky enough. For sure. I, t- I totally relate to that. I think about a lot of stories where even my buddy, um, John Party, he, he, him and I have talked about it before, but last year in the Thirst Lounge, he put himself in a spot where he, he couldn't fail running this like six minute mile prop bet that he had. And uh, he performed. And it, it, there's definitely something about putting ourselves in spots where we feel, I guess, like we can't fail, you know? Yep. And that true competitor, I think, comes out. 
Yeah. And I mean, you have to perform, right? Like you can, failure is still a possibility, but you got to give everything you have. Poker demands 100% effort if you want to be successful. That's just, you know, the sacrifice that you have to make as a human being, because you want to be in the top 3%, you're not going to get there giving anything less than a hundred. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you, you give yourself a shot. Your girlfriend doesn't have a job. You've got your job. You hit your ceiling. You got 2,500. What happens next? So from that point, then I remember just feeling a great like release off my back. And I had some, uh, a little bit of financial cushion, not as much as I would have liked to have had, but I was confident that I could continue to perform and, you know, pay our bills. And again, I was just mostly motivated by like, I need to know, you know, and uh, so from that point, I committed, I was then not reporting to my job in the morning, I was getting up. And I was, you know, six tabling. And I remember in my mind, I was like, I know I can figure this out, right? And then I started to notice that players were doing certain things. Like I start, I figured out and started to understand player types, right? And this has just always been like my thing since then that moment when I dedicated my focus and everything to it and like figure it out. Because at this point, I did not know about coaching sites. I did not know about like training materials, nothing. It was just, I'm going to figure this game out. And I noticed that with my hyper focus just on things that, you know, oh, this person seems to do this on this board. And, and then I started color coding people and I had developed a system, which uh, I use to this day. And that honestly has been everything with me in poker. Like I figured I didn't know that I was exploiting people. Like I didn't understand how to articulate what I was doing, but I figured something out and it seemed to work. And that first year of me just like six tabling MTTs, taking notes, color coding players. And then I was probably making some bogus plays, but it, I did things that just seemed to work, you know? And uh, it just, I think also too, that sometimes life will like give you a little boost if you're kind of heading down the right path. And I also feel like I read somewhere, I forget where it was about like, you'll get lucky kind of like if poker or whatever is meant to be, you know what I mean? Like life will give you a shot. And I feel like that first year when I dedicated it to it, like I just went like this on this like big upswing and like it positioned me to like, oh, wow, I can do this. You know, I had like 60, 70 K profit playing on this like small site my very first year. Like who was not going to be like, I am the man, like I'm going to continue to do this. And sure. that propelled me and made me believe that I could do it, which has, you know, 10 years later has me here. Yep. It's positive feedback that what you're doing is working. And yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you're, you made some bad plays. Like the goal of poker is never to play perfectly, right? It's just better, play better than my opponents, make less mistakes than they make, especially in a game of imperfect information. I love the way that you went about tagging, categorizing players making different archetypes in your mind as far as how do I play against this human? I, I tweeted a few days ago that one of our only goals in poker is to know our opponents better than they know themselves. And when you start paying attention to patterns and how people are playing and you've got weighed a little deeper in the decision tree, you find these exploits. You find spots where, oh, they play their value range by check raising on the turn and they just called the turn. Therefore on the river, they don't have that strong of a range and they're going to be overfolding. So it's a great spot to bluff, right? What's interesting is that knowing that this person raises their value and makes it to the river with not a strong range, they don't know that about themselves. So like they just know when they call the turn and they face a river bet, they feel bad. They feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable and then they fold and they're really folding out, you know, probably 90, 95% of their range. So like, you know how, how, what they're doing better than they do. And that's what gives you an edge. That's how you find the exploits. Yeah. Yeah. So you crush it and there's likely some stumbling blocks in the future, right after 2010. Tell For me sure. about April 15th, 2011. So I, at this point when Black Friday happened i i was like a, only a couple months on like full tilt 
and, and playing because I'd found out about Carbon Poker, which used to be PokerRoom.com, I think. And so I was playing on that small site, crushing. Why I change? Why go anywhere else? I was destroying it. But then uh, I kind of probably went on. Yeah, I did. Towards the end of 2010, I went on a downswing. And then I found out about coaching and backing. I kind of found out about the poker world at the end of 2010 that actually existed that I didn't know about. And then... Why didn't you investigate that before? Why were you lone wolf? I, I ha- I literally was so surprised. I had no idea. Like this is my, I, I straight had no idea. My focus was just like, get up, play, keep figuring out your, your system. And it was working. So I wasn't pushed to explore outside of that. Cause you know, I didn't want to mess with it, I guess. But then I went on my biggest downswing ever. I went on a 3k downswing at the end of 2010. And then of course I'm like, I'm scared. I'm nervous. Like I need to start looking into stuff. And then I started Googling and then I found out about this coaching site. And funnily enough, I reached out to them. I was like, Hey, you know, I want to get some coaching and, you know, just get better. And they're like, Oh, you know, can you send us your shark scope? And I did. And then they actually in turn asked me to be a coach instead of giving me coaching. And I was like, okay. And that kind of started a, a coaching path for me. But uh, what side was that, by the way? It, uh, Team Moshman. I'm not familiar with that. But do you know uh, Colin Moshman? I've heard the name. I'm yeah, guessing he's, he's written it's, some it's books that are at, like Barnes and Nobles. Yeah, yeah. He 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 had a site. Uh, I don't think he still has it, but it was like a staking uh, and coaching for percentage type of site. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I got caught up with him, and then through his company. I started to play on full tilt a little bit, getting back there. And then, yeah, I remember the day before Black Friday, I had a 5K score. I won some $82 um, tournament on full tilt. And then, you know, Black Friday happened and everything. And that actually didn't, outside of, you know, that money, and I was just starting to really like that client, it didn't affect me too much because then I was already grinding on carbon poker for the majority of my volume and whatnot. But what was interesting that I remember happened after Black Friday is the introduction to min raising preflop because uh, all those like stars, um, full tilt, you know, the crushers and everyone, they didn't have those sites. So they started coming over to like Carbon Poker and some of these other smaller sites. And I remember specifically because I've always been so focused on watching tendencies and, and things like that. And then I noticed, I was like, because 3Xing pre was the norm, you know? I don't even really remember ever doing anything. And then I had a couple of poker buddies at this time, post Black Friday, with all this influx of these uh, other players that were on these other sites. It was like min-raising. I was like, what is this? It, w- it was like a really funny, like weird moment. And then I was like, oh, this is a thing now? I was like, I don't understand. The game totally changed at that point. And I remember, honestly, I think from that point... I kind of, I didn't adjust. I didn't catch up. I I started to suck, I feel like, for at least a year or two trying to adjust to these players. I was still having some success, but there were guys coming over, man. I remember um, the battler was one of them. Um, Mike, what is his last name? It's like Ketchum or Keshem, something like that. But this dude, I remember I had him tagged as a donkey and he was just an absolute wizard, man. And it was him and some other guys that came over and literally just started destroying carbon poker. I would still get mine here and there, but the game had completely changed after that, mixing these like actual high stakes, good thinking players with this small, intimate, like US facing site. Uh, And I, I probably went on a downswing, I would say like what felt like it for like a year or two until I started to then finally like adjust because again, I'm just getting introduced to the game 2010 into 2011 and then now there's like this big evolution happening right in front of my eyes and now i know you know it had already happened you just hadn't been exposed to it yet (laughs) Uh, yeah like i mean that that was the reality of life back then in 2011 it's like you lose your home place to play and you're in the u.s what do you do you try to find another place to play uh for me i had been playing at that point for seven years when black friday happened and I had a lot of money locked up and I was just like, fuck online poker. Like 
I was so annoyed with online poker and I felt like I couldn't trust any site. Um, I actually started to try out carbon poker and then I read somewhere that their cash outs were taking a little while to process. And like, mm-hmm. this was like an instant red flag to me. And I was like, Nope, not gonna, I think it was lock poker, which was uh, a skin of carbon. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I never deposited on lock poker, thankfully because lock poker went under and nobody got paid. And I, what happened with carbon poker? Did it as a network just die? No, they, they, I think they're still, they're actually still running games. It's just that they are not promoting. And I don't even know that they're like accepting new players. Last I, last I heard they had like cut a lot of the guarantees. It's just kind of, it almost feels like it's somebody's like little passion project, like at this point, you know? Right. Yeah. Bodog was the place to be back then. Like, is that where you went? your transition after black friday uh after black friday i'm i still played on carbon poker for a while though cash outs and getting checks were taking weeks you know at least a, a two to four weeks at that time i know it grew to longer times at that point but i was how did you feel by the way like did you have a good relationship with your bank getting these checks and taking them in there they seemed fine i would do a lot of like mobile deposits or, or like ATM deposits, I wouldn't necessarily go in. And fortunately, I didn't have any of my checks get flagged or anything like that. So I feel like I kind of ran well. Probably. I, I, I went in there. I probably should have just done mobile deposit. And because every time I went in with one of those freaking $3,000 checks from Singapore, like there would be so many questions as like, what are yeah. you doing? Like, <laughs> why mm-hmm. are you getting these checks? And always made me feel super uncomfortable. So it was like not even a happy day when I would get a check. It's like, oh, I got to go to the bank and hope that they buy the story that I tell them because I can't say that I'm playing online poker because that's not good. Um, It was just really bad until Bitcoin came and kind of saved the day from getting those checks. Yeah, for sure. But I was just curious as to your experience with cashing all those checks. Yeah, it was... I, I I faded going inside of banks and kind of got lucky. I also had my girlfriend then at that point was working at the bank. She she wasn't. So we had, it was easier. Sometimes I can't remember if I would give it to her, if we would still just do mobile deposit. But yeah, that for sure made it easier now that I think about it too. Yeah. Helps when you got an in, inside person yeah. <laughs> facilitating your your checks. Yeah. That was another thing too, actually, for me, as far as the struggle post of Black Friday and checks and all that stuff slowing down. I also had my significant other, you know, she was working a full-time job at this point. So it helped when I was not making money through through playing poker. And at this point, i had also got into uh, coaching a little bit. And uh, so that was a little bit of side income. And then I found out about like being an affiliate of, of sites you know, so that provided, so I was starting to build like little drips of income, you know, on the side, which I think is important in this game for sure. Uh, so that helped me for a while, but it was a struggle, man. It was a struggle. Like I think, I think over the, over the last 10 years, there's definitely been at least a few years where, you know, our income, like she definitely, you know, shouldered some stuff you know, for a minute as, as I was trying to figure it out, cause I didn't want to give up on it. I still believed in, in the downswings that, that we could make it work. And at that point it became like a, a way of life, you know, poker, like that was my identity for yeah. a minute. So, I mean, it's tough because you didn't get worse. It was just when folks don't have the ability to pull out a card and make a deposit and there's no advertisement that's funneling in new players to the tournaments, they get harder the players that are in there are in there because they think they have an edge and just the competition level just went way up on you. And that's going to cause anybody to struggle. Like guys that were VPNing to Europe after a few years, after the Europeans kind of had access to the whole marketplace and Americans were kind of in the dark. Like a lot of the American crushers struggled versus the euros because the euros were at the, the top of the totem pole. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, yeah, things, things got a lot less easy after black Friday in a wide variety of ways, but how'd you make it work? 
I, I continued to try to find other ways to make income. You know, I started, I remember I did a, uh, I had a little backing stable, small, you know, group of guys that uh, I tried that. And that's a lot of work, but I did make a little bit of money from that. And then, so kind of just like struggled, I would say, trying to see what works for a minute, have a score here and there. It was weird for about a year or two, 2011 up until 2013. It's like her and I would struggle, but then something would just always like keep us afloat, like a random $1,600 check from some settlement thingy. It was like life was like, just hang on guys, you know, kind of it felt like. And then in 2013, uh, I got an opportunity to make uh, training videos for Pocket Fives, and, which eventually became Card Runners. So that was a nice, at that point then, uh, aside from playing poker, I had some affiliate income, I had the coaching income, and then I was making training videos. So at that point, I was kind of like able to tread water. And then until I got better with poker, but I still wasn't even like, I was being from 20, I would say from 2011 to 2014, I was the stereotypical sweatpants, sloppy hair, not well taken care of, eat bad food, smoke weed, um, and try to make it in poker without doing the actual work type of grinder. You know what I mean? I fell into like a um, a pit or something. And, you know, the not going from crushing, there were so many things that kind of contributed to that going from crushing to getting crushed. And then, you know, you just have not bad, good days and then, you know, relationship stuff. And so for a while, it was it was a struggle, man, honestly, for at least three years. How did you get out of the struggle? What led to spiraling upward? Uh, I would say the spiraling upward was uh, it started with change of scenery again for some reason I don't know I think that like changing the the place you're at I like rearrange my place in the house like three four times a year and then like I, I've moved so many times I for some reason feel like a, just a refresher so we had in 2014 had moved to a different part of North Carolina. Uh, my girlfriend had got some sort of promotion. So we had like moved to like a nicer place. It kind of felt like a big uh, upswing, you know, and then I was still not fully like in the mindset that I needed to be in to even make it to where I am today. There was though, what had happened, I was still like this lazy online grinder. And I actually had a uh, I had hurt a nerve in my leg because I wasn't eating well. I was just like getting fat and stuff and sitting all day. My uh, one sciatic nerve I had pinched. And one day I got up and I couldn't like get out of bed. Like I, I went and then like, oh, like this, you know what I mean? And then we had to go to like the emergency room. I couldn't stand. I had to get this big like steroid shot or this big metal needle um, in my butt and then whatever else. But that was a huge, huge moment in my life because I was then like on these pain meds and it was like, look, buddy, people were telling me that I was going to have this pain. I wasn't going to be able to sit. I couldn't do my stuff. It was terrible. The right side of my leg all the way up to my groin would go numb. And I was scared, dude. I was like, this can't be it. I, I, I sit and play poker. Like, this is what I do. It was like, am I going to be in like a wheelchair? Like my leg going to fall off? Like all these like thoughts went through my mind. And it was another turning point where uh, I remember I was with my buddy and we were in the pool because it helped. We were standing at this like community pool and he was living with uh, my girlfriend and I at the time. And there were these older women off to the side and they were talking and they were like, I remember what they said, man, it, it fired me up so much. She goes, uh, once you get sciatic pain, you know, that's kind of just it. You're just done. You have to deal with it the rest of your life. And I was, <laughs> when I heard that, man, I was like, no. Right. And then from that moment, like I got how, out of the How pool. old were you? I was 20. Let's see. Late. I think I was 29, maybe. Yeah. At this point. It's and, not very, it's not very yet at 29, right? 
Yeah, yeah, no. But then that just kind of made me realize that I was not doing all the things that I needed to do in order to be successful at anything, really. Do you know what I mean? Like, why did I deserve anything? Was I working? That, that was the moment I was like, am I working harder than the guy next to me? You know, like I refused to be a victim of, you know, my laziness and stuff. And then I was like, I'm going to figure out how to get past my sciatic pain. And I did. I, it was kind of simple ish. It's like just strengthen your core stretch every day. And I, I focus on those things and I do it every day now. And I actually have like a, a sensor. Like if I ever feel my right leg starting to go numb, I was like, okay, you're eating bad. You're not working out. You're not stretching, you know? T- and I just touch do that stuff where you recognize that you got to take better care of yourself else mm-hmm. things are going to spiral down. I think that's a pretty big wake up call to somebody Dude. who's 29 years old poker player. And it's a trap that lots of folks can fall in where, you know, we play a game that we use our cognitive abilities to make decisions. And that's what gives us our edge. Our brain is the tool we use that gives us our edge. And when we fuel our brain with bad stuff and we're not moving around, we're not expending energy so that, you know, we can be more focused, like while we're playing at the table, right? Like, naturally our bodies will burn as much energy as it predicts we're going to need. So if you don't do anything, you're not going to have much energy because your body's like, yeah, he's going to sit around all day. Why does he, why does he need that energy? Right. He's not going to get out and move and run and jump and lift stuff. So like it all, it's all part of the package for being a successful poker player because you need that energy. Your mind needs it. Your brain needs it in order to perform at a high level. And I don't care who you are. If you get fat, you eat bad, you don't move, your poker play is going to suffer. There is a monetary cost to that that is tangible, and it is in the thousands and thousands of dollars, depending on what stakes you play and how, under, how your underperformance just affects your results. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, for sure. That was That was the moment that I realized just because I think there's a thing with like playing online for sure. Like a lot of us, like if I'm not playing, I'm not, I don't have that opportunity to make money and we place a very low value on these other things. And then, so when I realize like I'm about to lose everything because I'm not placing a value on, you know, a high enough value on my health and all these other things, that was the trigger because I, now I'm researching how to get past this pain and everything. And then now I'm shifted my mindset, shifted into a growth mindset, you know, and now I'm starting to focus on how can I grow myself? How can I stay strong with things not playing? And then that was also the year then that I found out about like mental game in poker. Um, Jared Tendler's mental game of poker books. I found out about those. And I remember at this point, I was for sure feeling like I had hit a ceiling in my game. Like what else can you teach me? You know what I mean? Like with these training videos and all this other stuff, I was like ceiling, ceiling. And then um, in my, you know, enlightened growth focus now, I found these mental game of poker books and I read those and I was like, oh, and then I feel like the ceiling was removed again. And I was like starting to really, really go up because I was like, oh, you know, like the, the... I've always been kind of a pretty chill in control of my emotions type of guy. Like I've handled them well. So the first um, book I didn't attach to as much, but then the second book talking about like getting into the zone and performance and then a game, B game, C game. When I found out about all this stuff, I was like, Oh, this is sick. You know, like there's ways I can still calibrate myself even more and then get more out of myself. And uh, you know, honestly, since 2014, I've been super focused on just if you're not growing, you're kind of dying type of thing. You know what I mean? Yep. If I, I like what you said there, that that's a greatness bomb that when you learned about the mental game, it removed the ceiling once again. And if you're at a table with say eight other people, all at relatively the same level of technical ability what separates them after that point is purely mental game. Who's going to be able to perform at a high level the longest? Who's going to manage their emotions better than the other folks? That's where the edge is derived from. And when you start talking about like a recreational player 
who already struggles technically, and then add on top of that mental game struggles, well, that just compounds the issue and increases your edge that much more. And I think, you know, in my opinion, we, we talked about incremental changes over time as far as poker strategy goes. And I believe that to be 100% true. But like, mental game is always a struggle. It's always something that you can improve and work towards. And that's something that can kind of give you focus and energy. Like, how do I become stronger? How do I get knocked down and stand up again with more clarity than this dude next to me? Because we're all getting knocked down. We're all getting punched in the face. It's about who recovers better and more efficiently and quicker. And like, you want to be that guy. And that's something that all poker players struggle with on a daily basis. Uh, I think nobody's got like the mental game solved. Like Galfon took time off when he was getting crushed. Why? Because his mental game was struggling and Mm -hmm. he had all of these thoughts that we all have during a big downswing. So like, yeah, if you ignore it, if you think, yeah, I'm good, I've got no improving to do. And that dude next to you is doing work every day. Guess what? He's going to get the edge. That's just uh, a fact of life. That was awesome to see Phil through through that journey. You know, the fact just his awareness, his ability to communicate his feelings and, you know, be vulnerable, essentially. That was another big thing that I've learned in the last few years is the value of vulnerability. And um, yeah, seeing that, that was so cool. You know, when he type up his stuff, take a break, blah, 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 blah. Him, you know, honestly assessing, you know, if there's an edge where it is and everything and then to come back and come back, you know, and come up victorious at the end at the buzzer. It was so epic. Yeah. I still, I'm still in shock at the way that that whole thing turned out. Me and Nick Howard did a whole podcast on the Galfon challenge when he took, took his break. And basically I was like, yeah, call it like it's over. Just concede, (laughs) like just concede right now and probably concede to action freak as well. While you're at it, it's probably the most plus EV play because in my mind, He got smashed. He was getting smashed. There was no clear view that he had any sort of an edge. Um, Now, was he running bad? That's likely. But you can run bad and still not have an edge. And you're not guaranteed when the thing restarts to start running good. So, yeah, that's one of the more incredible feats in poker that I will probably see in my entire life. Because it's got to be. It's like almost scripted, right? Like it's like, fact is stranger than fiction. If that were in a movie, nobody would believe it. Like you would say, yeah, that's such bullshit. Um, <laughs> dude's just going to beat on him and beat on him in real life. And it's gonna, the hole's just going to be that much bigger. But yeah, he willed his way through it, that wily Galfond. You've heard me talk early and often about how improving your awareness while you're playing cards so that you make better decisions in the moment and notice trouble spots that merit deeper consideration is one of the most valuable things you can do to make more money on the felt. In my conversation with the only four-time WPT main event champion ever, Darren Elias, he told me that his ability to shut out all of the distractions in the world and fully focus on making great decision after great decision is his superpower he most attributes to his success. And you cannot improve your awareness at the tables without being fully present. When you learn how to stay fully in the moment on the green felt, you can finally have a clear path to becoming the absolute best version of yourself, which leads me to Jason Sue. Jason is one of the foremost authorities on the planet when it comes to playing poker with presence. As a matter of fact, he even wrote the book on it. Here's a direct quote from Nick Howard at Poker Detox on Jason's ability to help you stay focused. Quote, Jason's work is a new paradigm in poker and performance. End quote. And these aren't just empty words. Nick has put his money where his mouth is by hiring Jason to coach up the Poker Detox crew. And as a loyal listener of Chasing Poker Greatness, you know by now that I would not be promoting anything I didn't 100% believe would improve your poker skills and your life. So if you want to master your emotions and perform at your peak with presence while doing battle in the arena, You'd be doing yourself a grave disservice if you didn't check out Jason's work at PokerWithPresence.com. One final time, that's PokerWithPresence.com. 
but yeah, let's get back. So your mental game's on point. You're working on it. You're working on your actual game. You're winning. You've turned it around. What happened next in like the late 2010s? Um, then in the late 2010s, dang, we're 2020. I thought we were supposed to have hoverboards by now, but, uh, I know. I know. <laughs> so then the late 2000s, 10s, I was actually, because let's see, 19 last year, 18. Yeah. So then for, I'm at this point, I think, let me see, six. Six years, yeah, I'm about six, seven years into uh, my relationship. And then this is when kind of she never really understood poker, got behind it. My family never did. You know what I mean? I was kind of like, just, all right, he's just doing whatever he's doing. You know what I mean? Like, don't ask about it, stuff like that. Why? How did that make you feel, by the way? It's, it was discouraging, but my parents, um, my mom grew up in the Philippines, so she kind of had this third world country upbringing, very strict, and you know they didn't have much. And my dad's a Marine, so he was very strict, and like everything was like this, this, this. Like for instance, um, sports. If I would not do something that they wanted to as a kid, the punishment was you can't go to baseball practice, you can't go to your basketball game. They they would you know threaten those things. They didn't actually do it. I don't think maybe baseball practice once or something i tell you your parents were a lot smarter than mine because if they would have if i would have been threatened with taking away baseball like i would have been in line (laughs) that (laughs) that was what i lived for you know that that was what i enjoyed more than anything else i think it's like a six to ten year old oh for sure me too like it definitely like they went for it you know and i cleaned my room or whatever they said is like are you actually serious like okay yeah. Uh, so maybe sick play by them for sure. Though there was a part of me that was like, it's kind of a dirty play. You know <laughs> what I mean? Too. It, uh, it, it's it's a spectrum where it, it, it's a hard line to walk, right? Like mm-hmm. when it comes to your kids, because let's be honest here. Like, look at the world. Look at everything that's happening. Like, we're fallible. None of us are perfect. We're going to make mistakes and kids are going to make mistakes. And so there needs to be some level of forgiveness and comfortability that, yeah, okay, you can mess up and that's okay. It's a part of life. There don't need, there doesn't need to always be these dramatic consequences for a mistake because a lot of times in life, like the consequences of a mistake are enough. Like we feel bad enough for the things that we do poorly that that's enough. Yeah, for sure. So I guess I, I kind of, the, the fact that they didn't get behind the poker was, it didn't bother me initially because, you know, that's kind of just like their way was the way they don't understand. it. It's like whatever, whatever you're doing, whatever, you know, they, they wouldn't show any interest in it. They didn't really go to my sporting games or anything really? like that. Yeah. No, they like rarely ever went to any of my games. Um, they just, why not? I, I guess they just, my dad wasn't good at sports. My mom didn't play sports you know what I mean she just like was raised to be a mom and take care of other people you know she there was like six or seven of them kids and she was the one who had to cook and clean and all that so very uh, I picked up a lot of this from her too I feel like just very procedural you know in in the day-to-days and then my dad was also you know like work you come home and then you do this and that and the they never really in their upbringings I feel like recreational sports and things like that. They knew the value of it. They put me in sports, but they never understood how to support or be like a cheerleader or that just didn't, they were just too busy with their other stuff. Yeah. I I think that's too bad. Oh yeah, it it, it was. And I, and I think about it. I remember there was uh, a time my mom posted on Facebook in the mid 2010s, something about, she said, good luck to me for like the first time. It was some sort of tournament or something I was doing. She said, good luck to me. And I got emotional about it. You know, it's like she never did that or showed that care or focus to even ask. And it, it does hit me hard. Like I don't take it personal, I guess, you know, but then when moments like that happen, I was like, oh, wow, this actually means a lot more to me than I think about sometimes. 
Sure. And even recently, uh, my dad called me. I was about to start my stream. This was like, dang, this was like two weeks ago. My dad, for the first time, I've been streaming for uh, as a partnered streamer for like four years now, playing poker for 10 years. And for the first time, he actually asked me about my work. He's like, and he was like having a real moment. He's like, so I don't understand what you do. Can you explain it to me? Right. And it literally blew my mind. I tweeted about it. Uh, and a lot of people must have connected to it. There was, a, there was a, a bunch of likes on it. But I was like, I just had a real conversation with my dad, who's an alcoholic, by the way, that's another story. Um, for the first time, maybe ever about like, you know, stuff. And he was inquiring about me and poker is like, how do you make money is like, is it good? You know, and it really like hit, I, I like it threw me off balance, you know, so kind of thinking about how much they've not really supported. And then these like little tiny moments, it's like, and now I was talking about, it's like, I guess it does mean a lot. I mean, I would for sure, like if I ever have kids one day, like I'm going to be the biggest cheerleader. And you know what I mean? All kids want validation from their parents. All kids yeah. want to say, good job, good work. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. You know, I think yeah. kids need that because it feeds into our confidence, our sense of self as we get older through life, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm glad that your dad made the first step though, as far as inquiring and asking about what you do, because yeah, it's just even at how old are you now? 35, 36. Yeah. 30, 36 years old. Like even now that validation means so much to you, right? Oh yeah. It's, it's huge. But yeah, so I guess I, we were leading up to the late 2010s. Yeah, your uh, she, wife, your, your wife didn't understand either. She, really. Yep, she did. She did not understand uh, it. She supported to an extent, but you know, never really whatever. I always felt like, you know what I mean? Like if your if your significant other ever has to say, it was a well, why don't you have sex with your game? You know what I mean? Like you know, kind of like deep down how they might feel about it, right? Yeah. Like I heard that before, so. There was always like a battle. It's almost like it, poker was like my side girlfriend. And then, you know, she was my other girlfriend. So anyway, I, I do think that that played a part in our downfall. Because basically then at the end of 2018, her and I broke. Let me see, 2018. Yeah, it was early 2018. And it probably started to happen at the end of 2017. We just were about to be done. And then it happened uh, in the beginning of 2018. I had moved out and I was living. Man, I, I got so lucky because I, online poker player, I don't really have like, I'm going to go like show my income stubs and here's my W-2s. Like, can I rent a place here? It was, buddy, it was scary. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I had to figure it out. So I got lucky. Uh, I stayed in this shared apartment in Wilmington, North Carolina. I was there for about six months and I got in on some sob story and like PayPal statement. Like, look, you know, here's my affiliate things, um, what I get here. And then here's like my streaming income that I'm getting. And by the grace of God, man, I somehow got into this place, shared spot, even though it was in the ghetto and I thought, on some nights, my shared apartment person was going to kill his girlfriend. It was crazy. I had my first anxiety attack in this place. And then I had the stream suffered. I was just getting by enough to like pay my rent. I had no money. And then I got an opportunity. One of my uh, Twitch uh, followers uh, called me up on the phone. He's, he's a friend at this point. He's like, hey, do you want like a change? of scenery, your life, you know, I, I have like an opportunity for you. And uh, people could see on your face as a streamer, like if you're going through stuff, whether or not we feel like we're bringing our like show face or whatever you want to say to the stream, viewers can see through that. I could tell in my numbers, they could tell me they knew I was going through a lot of stuff. And he reached out to me. And basically, then I was he he gave me a he helped me get a U-Haul or a rental car. To what did you think when he when he said you want this opportunity? I've got an opportunity for you, buddy. It felt like a movie. Like I was so excited 
to get away and the opportunity at something new because I was essentially just sitting in my own feces, I felt like, in this place, like trying to every day was just survive. And she, my ex, was still uh, not too far away of a drive. So there was, we were still having these crazy, stupid arguments. And you know what I mean? The whole breakup thing, like I needed to like get away because she would still come over and uh, it, it was just toxic. Yeah. So when he, he presented that to me, I was like, I knew that I had to do it regardless of any fears or anything like that. Yeah. Snap call. Yeah. It, it was a, a big time snap call. And that was, and then this is like the beginning of like a crazy two years for me because then the end of my 10 year relationship just crushed. I basically have nothing. And then now I'm in a rental vehicle with like three boxes and I'm driving across country to California. I have my stream up when I don't need uh, Google Maps on my dashboard and, and I'm like talking to people and they're like donating money for gas because I literally um, separations and this moving everything. I had no money, you know, like he, he, he paid for my rental car. He gave me a job when I got there. He, he let me use one of his cars and he um, hooked me up with a spot to live with one of his buddies that he was a business partner with and stuff. Like I was given everything and I had nothing, you know, and that was the start of me kind of healing 2018. That was like early ish 2018. And I had dedicated that year in my mind to getting over my ex, getting past that 10 year relationship and getting like healthy in my like mind, body and spirit, like everything. I dedicated the whole year. I was like, I'm not going out. I'm not talking to girls. I am only going to work at this job. Then I'm, I'm working at this uh, vaping company, uh, nine to five or whatever, come home, stream maybe two, three days a week. I have no bankroll. So I'm playing l- less than $11 tournaments, $2 tournaments. I'm doing like a $100 bankroll challenge because it at least added a narrative to me not having a bankroll, you know? And I, I just spent my gauge for when I was going to be healthy. That was my, my biggest focus in 2018. I had this song that I would listen to and it reminded me of her and I would like cry at the end of the song when like these certain words would come up. I was like, when I can listen to this song and not cry when these words come up, I'll know I'm over it and past it. And that took 11 months. Every right? day. Every, every day. I, w- I would listen <laughs> to the <this> song on, <laughs> on the way to work. I would listen to the song and some other ones and it would always, always get me. But it kind of felt good at that time to like feel something to even yeah. to cry, you know. Let me touch base, go back on your marriage ending, because yeah. uh, the the listener, I'm sure, some of you out there have a spouse that shows contempt with poker, because that's that's the feeling that I get when you when somebody says, "Why don't you just have sex with your game?" They're showing a lot of contempt for what it is you're doing. They're making it very small, which in turn makes you small, you know, because poker is your identity, right? So Mm -hmm. how, like, after the fact, after your emotions have died down from the scenario, do you think you could have handled it differently or better? And what is your advice for somebody whose significant other treats what they love with contempt? I 100% um, looking back at the relationship, everything, no, I could have done better. You know, I I believe that towards the end of it, I was doing much better, but uh, she had already kind of positioned her beliefs and didn't really adjust much. You know, I I was continuing to grow and she kind of stopped growing. So, you know, she was here. And uh, as far as what I had tried to do towards the end, which I think was just less effective because she was very closed minded towards, towards the end is I tried to get her more involved, a, explain to her more versus it just being something that I go off and do. And she has nothing about knows nothing about, you know, so I tried to find ways to bring her in more. One thing I needed to do more was uh, be present. You know, it's tough with poker, especially if you like, you have like a long eight hour session, uh, grinding MTTs, cash, whatever you 
you kind of don't turn off immediately right after. But like, that's kind of when we turn off the computer or step away from it, that's kind of when we need to like be present with our significant others. So for me, it was always like tough to turn off at first. And and again, it was something where I didn't understand for a while the value of being present and completely turning off because I'm just thinking in my mind, it's like, I need to make money for us. I need to perform. I need to pay bills. And I get, you get overly focused on just like the um, overly focused on playing because you're not making money versus prioritizing your health. I wasn't, it, it's a similar thing, kind of being present and like knowing and training yourself to shut off so that you could be fully there with that other person. And they know, okay, when he's here, like he's here or, or she's, she's here. I think that is the very challenging thing. Cause the game, especially too, when you're, you're just running scenarios back over your head, if you had a bad session or you just busted a final table bubble, like that's going to linger for a minute, you know? And then I think so, uh, a cool play is kind of having a reset after a session, like instead of going right from computer to like, the bed with them or hang out immediately with them to maybe go for a walk, clear, clear your mind, clear your headspace, you know, get some fresh air and then come back and be present. Absolutely. That would be the biggest advice I would give to some people. Yeah. I mean, the reality is like, there needs to be good information both ways. Like as poker players, we need to explain to our significant others just how mentally taxing and how much brain power it takes to compete at what we're doing, to have an edge, to make money. So like, because a lot of times too, you know, you're playing, you're in a decision and then they'll make a bid for your attention and you just ignore them, right? Because you're hyper-focused on what's going on. And Mm -hmm. when you ignore those bids for attention, you know, it comes back to bite you eventually. They, people feel like they're being ignored, right? Like, because Mm -hmm especially if they don't view poker as a profession, as a legitimate thing that you're investing your time and energy into, if it's just some silly game you're playing, well, why can't you pay attention to me for two seconds instead of staying so focused in your game? So like, you know, the groundwork needs to be laid to where you can say like, you know, when I'm playing cards, I'm playing cards and I'm making decisions and this is what I'm doing with my life. It's a, it's my job, right? Like no sane person, I don't think, would come to you while you're working in the middle of a business meeting with a client and ask that you pay attention to them because it it just doesn't make sense. Right. Right. So like, I think that that needs to be just fully understood by, by both folks. And also like, yeah, people, when you ignore bids for attention, they get pissed. (laughs) Like they, they come to resent you. It does not, it does not end well if they don't fully understand that like I'm tied up. And when I bust out, like, like you bust out of a tournament, right. And your session ends. So typically your sessions are going to end not in a super positive way. Right. Right. And we use so much brain power. Like when we're talking about taking care of ourselves so that we can perform at a high level, you're spent after a session, you are mentally, emotionally spent. And so you do need to decompress. You need to get away because you just, you can't function cognitively at a high level, like right when you're done. And I think that making the analogy of like, yeah, when you get done working for 10 hours, you need to decompress, right? Like you don't, you don't want to just walk in the door and be bombarded with questions and all of these things. So like, this is what I need as well. And you know, it's, it's tough navigating as a young person when you don't know anything about anything. And there's no playbook, right? There's no playbook for no. poker players and spouses and what you need to both understand and how you can support each other and how you can do well. You just kind of learn it on your own. And unfortunately, a lot of us are kids <laughs> when yeah. we're first getting into poker. So we're not emotionally equipped to be able to deal with it. For sure. It's, it, it's tough, man. It's, it's something that people will ask me on stream and we'll have conversations about. But I feel like it would be sick if there was some sort of manual or guide or like you know how to manage a relationship while being a poker player you know with somebody who's not a poker player and doesn't get it we've probably just hit on a good book to write a good piece of content to share with people because i'm sure that your experience is not super unique for professional poker players it's very common 
No way. It's super, super common. And a lot of people struggle with it, man. I know a lot of relationships go down the tubes because of it. And, you know, I know I've always, you know, meant well and stuff. And, uh, but then, you know, there's casualties, you know, inside of that hard lessons learned. And yeah, yeah it, it, it's tough. It's very complex. It's very complex. So you move. You're in California, man. You're I'm in California. You're on your own. You're in California. You've got a new lease on life. Yep. I'm just trying to, again, get healthy so that I can do whatever, you know, life has for me next. And then it took about 11 months until I kind of felt like, all right, you know, like I'm, I'm back, like I'm strong, I'm healthy, I'm, I'm ready to go. At this point, I'm still mostly living paycheck to paycheck, you know, with the job I have. I mean, eating out food, I wasn't going out partying, I wasn't really buying anything. I was just streaming and just making enough to essentially get by for the most part. And then at the end of the year, there was a video that went out on Twitter. Bill Perkins, Jamie Staples, and Jeff Gross put out a video, The Thirst Lounge. They're looking for a host, right? And I remember seeing the video. And I've talked about this so many times in like uh, random little pieces and stuff like on my YouTube channel. But I remember seeing the video, man, and I was scared. I was nervous, right? Again, the the whole nervous thing. I was like, but I knew, like I had some sort of, at this point, the way I had programmed myself, like fear means go is, is, what, is what I say. And I was fearful at this video and then all that self-doubt, like, oh, what if they don't pick me? What if I'm not good enough? What if I look like an idiot? Like all these stupid things come out, but the one thing that was just the most clear is like, I have to do this regardless of what happens. I know that this is like part of my journey now, submit a video. And then long story short, uh, they ended up picking 10 hosts. I was one of them. And then that was at the end of 2018. So basically all of 2019, I was in the Virgin islands, you know, with a 20 K bankroll, no expenses living in this mansion, you know, uh, with all these other people, we're just creating content, and I go on a uh, sick heater at the beginning of the project. I have my biggest scores. I'm playing the WSOP main event. I'm going to Costa Rica to play the 5K cage for ACR and like all this. 2019 was wild, man. And then 20, 2020, I'm here, you know, at, at the end of that project. Now I'm living with John, who was part of the Thirst Lounge as well. He was one of the hosts. And now we're living together with me, John, and Arlie here in Canada. And just Arlie like, Shaban? you know, much better place. Shaban, yeah. Shaban, yeah. Yep. He, former <laughs> Chasing Poker Greatness guest, Arlie. Yep. Um, that's cool. So basically, it's like the, you know, your character arc of life. You've, you hit the turning point when you got divorced and mm-hmm. kind of lost all the things that you had and moved out west and reforged yourself. From a mindset perspective, can you compare your mindset today from nearing the end of your marriage? Yeah, today it's, I felt very, at the end of the marriage, the mindset was very smothered is how it feels. Like I was confident in a lot of what I was doing and the ways that I was trying to grow. But she wasn't on board, she had essentially given up. You know, she wasn't trying. And that was kind of like a big thing for me, you know, when I was seeing the not trying and this probably comes into play too. you know, she had a side thing going on, which was ultimately the end of us. You know, she Uh, there was there was another man in the picture. And um, you're just not present there. She wasn't present. You know, I wasn't present. And uh, that was a big thing that I learned from then till now is to like, be present, you know, at, at a much higher frequency than I was then. And to just, I mean, I just can't just work hard. You know, I don't, I don't know. The mindset now is very... I, I just, it's just me. I almost like, <laughs> I keep telling my buddies, like thinking about g- getting into a relationship seems like so much work because I know what has to go into it. And right now I'm just, 
super focused on like my stream and, you know, creating content and just being like a positive influence and like building. Now I want to, right now I'm in the mindset of, I want to build a lot of things now, you know, build this financial freedom, build my stream, build my community so that later in life, you know, I can enjoy some other things, but I'm kind of just like over that stage and I just want to work like really hard right now and, and grow as much as I can. So, um, but you are know, tempted. I, I, See, I, I do hear the temptation of getting involved again. Well, well, I mean, yeah, that's like in, in our, in our, I guess our chemistry, our DNA or whatever, you know, like it is, but it's, it's just, I'm, I don't know, man. I don't want to get distracted again. I feel like I've come so far and that I almost don't want to, and I don't mean it in any disrespectful way, but I just, I've come so far that I need to honor these opportunities that have been given to me by continuing to pursue greatness in every way that I can. And so I'll reveal something. I, I, I got divorced myself um, in a very similar situation where just don't understand poker and mm -hmm. comments like, um, you don't have a job. You play a game. You don't have a job, right? Yep. And so, you know, I was very, I, I was way too young to get married anyway. And I did not know my head from a hole in the ground in a lot of respects it's as much on me and it's just the difference between having somebody who is antagonistic towards your career and then now being remarried to somebody who's my best friend and my biggest supporter that when I feel depressed and can't get off the couch, you know, she's the one saying, no, get up. Like you got this. You know, you're strong. It's night and day. It's a different life entirely. And it comes down to choosing well, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that like, if you do make that step, there are benefits. You know, you can, you can have a partner that instead of being a mental drag, gives you power, improves your mental game, improves your mental state, gives you more energy and more motivation. So I would look at it like that in that, it doesn't have to be a drag. You can also yeah. marry somebody who's your best friend and who supports everything that you do. And there's a lot of joy in that as you go on through life. Did or does she understand your wife now? Does she understand poker? Does she play at all or anything? She understands. She understands. She dealt poker for a while. So okay. she has had immersion with the poker world. So she gets it. Like, and also we can have frank conversations, right? I can, I can tell her that like, you know, I read this study on chess players and when they go to a tournament, they expend like 6,000 calories a day, every single day that they play because the human brain, despite being 3% body weight consumes 25% of our body's energy. Right. And so like when I, when we have these conversations and she understands that like, Oh, so you're expending this energy when you focus for three hours. So you're not going to be cognitively at a high level directly after you end a session, right? Because you're, you're spent, you're burned out. Um, just having that understanding of like where somebody's at when you're trying to interact with them is so huge. Like yeah. it, it, it's massive. So combination of things, just uh, way better, way better choice mixed with better communication and being able to express myself and what I'm going through. And it, it, it's night and day. I'm curious if there can be a relationship where the other side does not play poker or get it or get gaming. I feel, you know what I mean? I almost feel like gaming might be like a crossover there, you know? I will pose a very simple question. Would you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody who doesn't get it after having gone through what you experienced? No way. No fucking way, right? No way. No way. Maybe you can make it. Like maybe you can like grit your teeth and bear your way through decades in a relationship like that. But why on God's earth would you? 
Like it's just so much, like why would you want to be with somebody that isn't going to take the time to understand what it is you're pursuing and how that affects you on a daily basis? Like the person that you love and loves you more than anything should want to have these conversations openly to understand who you are, your journey and what it means to you. And if they're not willing to do that, fuck them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it can work if, if there's not that, uh, common ground on that either poker or gaming, you know, type of thing. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to come from poker background, right. But just want to understand and Mm -hmm. be open to understanding. Like I, it's my opinion that if they don't want to do that, if they have no interest, what's the point? Right. For sure. Yeah. It's not somebody that I, I, I would want to be with personally. But I learned I learned a lot too. I I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be able to to do anything like that again. I don't care how hot or how good certain things are. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course, of course. Like <laughs> it's uh, when you're young, you do dumb things, and you there are red flags, and there are things that you realize may be out of place and may not work long term, but you're like a bad poker player, right? You have a bad hand and you just don't know how to fold it. Like you flop the freaking bottom pair and you're just going to hold on for dear life. Um, This guy's bluffing. (laughs) (laughs) This guy's bluffing. I'm going to suck out on the river. It's all going to be okay. No, you started with a shitty hand and you're going to end up losing your whole stack. So let's just start with a better hand and go from there. Yeah. So that's where you are now the you, that's Here your I am now your whole story you're living there with john and arlie and yep. uh let's move to the lightning round right let's move to some quicker questions if you have time for sure yeah um if you could gift all poker players one book to read what would it be and why okay if i could gift a book to all poker players to read it would be book that's coming to my mind is definitely the mental game of poker uh volume two and uh i just think that it really opened my mind to how much control we have over our performance and how much more we can actually get out of ourselves and it's trackable so uh, i think that's something that a lot of people will find a ton of value in just knowing that there's ways to manipulate yourself to get even more outside of just like poker strategy for sure and i love the the way you frame that and getting the most out of yourself right realizing our own potential and like you said you had fear when you were sending that video to perkins about the thirst lounge and that fear is because you're stepping outside of your comfort zone that fear is you saying, okay, I'm getting out of my comfort zone. I'm taking a risk and that's why you're nervous. And so like that, the only way to realize our potential as human beings is to lean into that fear, to experience it, overcome it and realize that you're more capable than you thought you were. And that's really what living is about to me is what am I capable of at the end of the day? And how do I push myself? Sometimes you'll fail. Sometimes you push yourself too far and you realize I just wasn't capable, but it's a lot better knowing what you're not capable of than getting to the end of your life and wondering what you could have been capable of. For sure. I like that. Yeah. So if you could erect a billboard, every poker player has got to drive past on their way to the casino. What's it say? Stay focused. I I believe, yeah, I believe I have a little sticky note on my laptop that I've had here for a minute. Uh, last year in the Thirst Lounge, we uh, got the opportunity to uh, go through Elliot Rowe's A Game Masterclass, the mindset. And there was a part in there that really attached to me. And um, I believe he said it in one of the videos, it might have been in one of the worksheets, but focus is a choice, right? And that's what I have on my laptop here. But I feel like it's so easy to be distracted. We're, you know, a lot of you know, we're playing online here, me primarily, you know, but even even live sitting at the tables, you could have your phone and just be super distracted. But like, if you want to like, I, I think ultimately we play poker, some people, yeah, for money, but I feel like at the end of the day, it's like we want to have fun, right? It's fun to compete. And like, it's fun to make money. 
And choosing to focus will it just increase our happiness and it just makes it more fun. So that's what my billboard would say is focus is a choice. I love that. That's a greatness bomb. You know, for the listener who plays any competitive sports, when you're playing a competitive sport, what are you thinking about? Like, are you daydreaming about what you're going to eat later that day? No, you're fully focused on the moment and doing your best. And focus is a choice. So when you're playing cards, choose to focus, choose inquiry, choose to ask questions and choose to grow versus searching YouTube or half-assing it. You know, give yourself a shot because if you're going to be successful at this game, it demands 100% focus and it demands all of your energy. What's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? Right now... So last year was the third sound project and that was like everything for me. Like I devoted all my energy to making sure that that worked, you know, uh, with all the moving pieces. And then now my, I would say my stream is like a, a major project because last year when we were in the third sound, we were primarily just streaming on that channel. So my, my channel just, it just declined. I, w- I wasn't on my channel streaming much at all last year. So my biggest project this year has been rebuilding my channel, you know, getting things back up. And, you know, it would be amazing if I could build it up to a point where we could get some sort of, you know, sponsorship or, you know, some online pro, you know, we were a team online, whatever. That would be amazing. But we are also working, John, Ebony and I are working on a uh, triple threat challenge. Uh, this challenge we put out on the internet, basically 10K prize we're the three coaches. We have two players underneath us that we gave 2K bankrolls to, and we're competing in a series of uh, challenges where they get points, and then the team with the most points at the end gets the uh, 10K. Wait. Oh, okay. They get the 10K. So yeah. you're giving all these players a 2K bankroll, mm-hmm. and then measuring it, whoever does the best gets the grand prize? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Giving back. Giving yes. back and growing your stream. I hope for all of our sakes that there are more opportunities for poker players, poker streamers, content creators who are trying their best to grow the game and bring more players so that poker can exist for a long time. I feel like, I mean, obviously I have like every bias in the world that um, there needs to be more incentive, monetary incentive from the powers that be so that these folks like myself, like you, continue provi- putting out a good product and investing their time and energy. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of time and energy that goes into each and every episode, each and every stream that's released. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Final question, man. Uh, where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the World Wide Web? So uh, I am live five, sometimes six days a week on my Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash bet on Drew. And my socials, Twitter, it's twitter.com slash bet on Drew. Instagram is instagram.com slash bet on Drew. And then uh, the YouTube channel is uh, bet on Drew poker. Awesome, man. It's been a joy, pleasure getting to know you better over this last hour and a half. And you know, I want you to come back on the show in a year or so. Let's catch up, see what you got going on. Thanks. Appreciate it, Brad. Take care, man. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.